Welcome to Aquaponics Academy, a bright agrotech podcast designed to help you overcome common aquaponic issues, learn new growing techniques, and help you be as successful as you can be as an aquaponic practitioner. Whether you're just getting started or you've been growing aquaponically for decades, this podcast is for anyone wanting to design the best performing system possible. Join aquaponics expert, Dr. Nate Story, the creator of Zip Grow Towers, as he breaks down complex topics into easy to understand information. And now, here's Dr. Nate Story. Hi there, I'm Dr. Nate Story from Bright Agritech, and this is Aquaponics Academy episode number 15. Today's episode is the first of a four-part nutrient series. In this episode, we're going to talk about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, what they do in your system, and why they're important to understand. Now, a lot of people will say, wait a second, uh, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen are not plant nutrients. And to that, I would say, yes, they are. They're just plant nutrients that no one talks about, right? The plant consumes oxygen, it consumes carbon, and it consumes hydrogen on a regular basis, uses it to build um, carbohydrates, that uses it to um, do all sorts of things, drives all sorts of like little cellular metabolic things. So um, believe it or not, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are actually some of the most important nutrients to plants. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about carbon. Now, when we talk about carbon in plants, um, it's most commonly found in two forms, right? It, there's CO2 or carbon dioxide, which the plants absorb. And then through uh, photosynthesis and some of these other uh, biochemical reactions within the plant, it basically takes that carbon and produces sugar, right? Sucrose. Um, it produces carbohydrates from that carbon. And um, the end result then, of course, is it can break those down. It can build all sorts of weird carbohydrates for all sorts of weird applications. Um, you know, uh, and it, it can use that as an energy source and it can consume that, uh, when, that carbon when it needs it, uh, break apart those molecules and get energy from that. Okay. So without delving too much into the biochemistry of that, uh, we can basically say that CO2 is essential for plant growth because plants, they do not consume other animals. They don't consume other things for the most part, right? Um, there are some like parasitic plants that steal carbohydrates from other plants. But by and large, if plants are... Um, are uh, you know, doing these photosynthetic reactions in their tissues, if they're, if they're, if they are photosynthesizing, um, then they are taking in CO2 from the atmosphere and they are smashing it apart and converting it into carbohydrates for, uh, growth and reproduction and cellular metabolism. Okay. So CO2 is super duper important. Carbon comes into our aquaponic systems in a number of ways, right? We have carbon entering the system as carbohydrates in the fish food, and it's broken down and eventually becomes CO2. Almost all these microbes love to break down carbohydrates. And so we have uh, carbohydrates entering the system, and then this entire little ecosystem of microbes breaks those things apart and releases CO2. They consume oxygen to break these things up, and they release CO2 into the system and into the atmosphere. Anything decay will do the exact same thing, right? It's taking uh, carbohydrates and converting them into CO2. So we have all this carbon entering the system and it's entering in the form of carbohydrates. It's also entering in the form of just, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's CO2. It's a constituent of all air everywhere. There is CO2 and it's coming into our greenhouse or a growing environment. Um, so in both of these ways, CO2 is entering the environment and plants are taking that CO2 and they are breaking it up. And that's, that's the obvious one, right? So the plants are using this, but what we forget is that our microbes are actually uptaking CO2 too. So when we, when we take CO2 out of the atmosphere and we turn it into something solid, when we take it from a gas and we turn it into like a carbohydrate, that's called fixing CO2, fixing CO2. So plants do a great job at fixing CO2, but microbes do an equally good job, sometimes a better job at fixing CO2 because um, all of this CO2 we have floating around, uh, it's soluble in our solution, it's slightly acidic, and so we've got all this CO2 floating around in our system, and microbes are taking that CO2 up as well, directly out of the solution. And they um, are actually doing things like nitrification reactions, okay, so oxidizing ammonia and nitrite into nitrate, and we already talked about that in a previous episode. But they're, um, 
doing these uh, little biochemical reactions and they're stealing electrons. They're getting energy from these re reactions. And what it means is they can use that energy to fix carbon. Now, what do they do with it? They build, do the exact same thing that plants do. So they're taking CO2 and they're using it to basically um, for, for cellular metabolism and to, uh, for, to, for growth and reproduction. So that's pretty darn cool. If you think about it, we've got plants that are taking up CO2 and we've got microbes that are taking up CO2. So um, CO2 in your solution in, in low levels is not a bad thing. Um, a lot of people get really worried about it if they come from traditional aquaculture because traditional aquaculturalists end up with a lot of dissolved CO2. And it not only messes with your pH in very large quantities, but it can also cause problems for your fish because CO2 is somewhat soluble and the fish are giving off CO2. And they basically want to prevent that, you know, they want that CO2 to exit the environment because they're constantly giving it off. And we don't want to saturate the environment. Uh, we don't want to mess around with our pH. And of course, we want to make it really easy for those fish to essentially breathe, right? So to do that, we want to maximize the amount of oxygen in the water and minimize the amount of CO2. So traditional aquaculture folks do not like lots of CO2, but in aquaponic systems, we love CO2. CO2 is great, great stuff. And unless you're way overstocking, it is unlikely that you will ever be producing so much CO2 from your fish that your microbes can't remove it, algae in your system can't remove it, etc., etc. So the other thing to remember is that you also have algae in your system. And some people have more algae than others. But algae also takes up CO2. And um, oftentimes when algae does this, we see what's called diurnal cycling, diurnal pH swings. This is really common in a lot of aquaponic systems, and it really confuses a lot of people because they might go in in the morning and their pH is fine, it's good. And uh, they might come back at 3 in the afternoon and their pH is 2 points higher and in the range where most nutrients are locked out, and they'll get really frustrated. They won't be able to figure out why this is happening. Well, what's actually happening there is your algae, which is basically a teeny tiny little itty bitty plant, is um, or related to plants, I should say, is taking oxygen out of the water, um, so our, our CO2. So during the night, um, you know, all of your algae, your microbes, a lot of these uh, organisms are consuming are consuming oxygen at night, right? They're metabolizing stored energy. And then during the day when there's sunlight, all of a sudden, boom, they become net energy producers. They stop consuming and they start producing, especially with algae. So uh, with algae during the day, they begin to uh, produce oxygen and consume CO2. So that's what people are actually seeing. They're seeing when that pH swings, they're seeing CO2 being removed from the environment and um, turned into more algae, which is not always a good thing, but it is what it is. So um, a lot of the time when you see that diurnal pH swing, what you need to do is control your algae. And uh, what you're doing by doing that is controlling the amount of CO2 in your solution. And what you're doing by doing that is controlling the acidity of your solution because CO2 becomes a weak acid in water. Cool, huh? I mean, it's kind of a weird thing. A lot of people don't really know what it is when they observe it, but there you go. That's what it is. Uh, you're observing diurnal pH swings directly related to algae taking up CO2. So uh, without getting too far into it, I could talk about CO2 ad nauseum. I could probably leave all of you guys just bored out of your mind hearing about CO2, but I'll save that for maybe a later episode. In this one, I just want to give you kind of a very brief overview of what CO2 does in the system. So uh, to recap, it's important for plants. Plants cannot grow without CO2 and preferably at above ambient uh, levels of CO2 so supplemented CO2. It's important for microbes performing nitrification processes. If you don't have enough CO2 in your environment, nitrification will slow and become less efficient. So that's, uh, that's some really important thing to remember. Also, it's great for uh, your algae, which is maybe not a great thing for you, but they love CO2. That's what they live on, right? Especially when it's sunny outside. So CO2 is an important part of all systems, and it is a main contributor of carbon to the system. Whether that carbon comes in as a carbohydrate and then gets converted to CO2 or whether it's just CO2 that enters the system otherwise, it's very important in plant and microbe metabolism. So without it, your system will be dead in the water. Oxygen. So oxygen is the next one. Oxygen um, 
and you'll hear this term DO or dissolved oxygen. You'll hear me talk about DO an awful lot. So when I refer to DO, that's what I'm talking about is dissolved oxygen. Now I did a YouTube um, video a while back that really I think does the best job of explaining this because it's it's visual right instead of just um, you know audio like this but you know oxygen is great stuff O2 it's in our atmosphere it's what we breathe it's what all aerobic organisms breathe right so aerobic is uh, referring to in the presence of oxygen and specifically O2 and anaerobic when you hear the term anaerobic we're describing something that is not in the presence of oxygen or Basically, it's growing without oxygen, and it's an entirely different way of growing. But there are a lot of organisms that are anaerobic, and there are a lot of organisms that are aerobic. Most of the organisms that we care about are aerobic, so they need oxygen to live. This includes plants, right? And especially in the root zone, where we're not producing oxygen in our tissues through photosynthesis, oxygen is really, really important. If you don't have good oxygenated root zones, then your plants will die. So it's important to have oxygen. Now, high temperatures are the enemy of oxygen, because the higher the temperature the water gets, the less oxygen can dissolve in it. It's one of those really weird elements that behaves this way, because most things become more soluble at high temperatures temperatures, but oxygen actually becomes less. So for folks that are struggling with oxygen or overstocking, it's sometimes worth taking your system temperature down a few degrees, and that will definitely help with oxygen solubility. But back to the topic here, oxygen is pretty much in the air, and it's also produced by the plants. So typically, if you're growing in like an enclosed space in a greenhouse, something like this, oxygen is in plentiful supply. And you can tell when you walk into your greenhouse and uh, you take a deep breath full of that wonderful, wonderful air, your lungs fill up and you just feel great. Usually there's a much higher ambient oxygen levels in enclosed spaces with plants growing than elsewhere, right? Because your plants are actually producing oxygen throughout the day. They're doing this with CO2 and water, right? So the cool thing about plants is they're able to split water molecules. Water molecules are really, really tough to split, but plants do it. Um, through this very complicated but powerful process called um, photosynthesis, and then they fix hydrogen in these amazing ways um, after they split these molecules apart. And without delving too deeply into ninth grade biology, it's just, it's amazing. It's totally amazing. And scientists are still kind of flummoxed by exactly how some of these processes take place. We've got a good idea. I mean, we're 95% of the way there, but there's still a lot of stuff. Uh, actually, maybe not even that far. Um, there's still a lot of things in these reactions that are a complete, amazing mystery. And that is a super cool thing to think about. But the plants are taking up water, right? And they're taking CO2 and they're, they're taking these things and they're kind of smashing molecules apart and recombining different elements to produce hydrocarbons, carbohydrates, right? You hear them referred to as car hydrocarbons. That's because they're typically a carbon atom with a bunch of hydrogen stuck to it. Sometimes, you know, in these long chains of carbon atoms tied to each other with hydrogens off to the side. So carbons like to form, uh, you know, if you think about it, kind of four connections, right? And they'll oftentimes uh, connect with two other carbon atoms and two hydrogen atoms to form these long chain hydrocarbons or these uh, carbohydrates, essentially. So um, that's pretty neat to think about. They're, they're get accessing oxygen in the atmosphere, they're, they're creating oxygen in the atmosphere by um, accessing mostly oxygen in water. And that is super duper neat to think about. But part of that um, reaction creates hydrogen. Hydrogen, again, is entering the system almost entirely in the form of water. So this water is in our system. We're adding water to our system. The plants are taking the water up. And really, the plants are some of the only ones doing this. Algae, uh, you know, engages in this as well. But they're taking up this water, and they're splitting those, those molecules apart, and they're using the different constituents to build carbohydrates and um, for other things as well, I guess. But mostly uh, for, for the time that we have here and for the sake of just keeping this relevant, just think about them splitting water molecules to make carbohydrates. It's totally, totally amazing. So it comes in in the form of water and it exits in the form of produce, right? So it exits in the form of uh, the crops that we take out of the system. And occasionally, like if we feed crops back into the system, then fish will take those up. And then uh, we remove hydrogen in the form of fish. And same thing with carbon, right? So um, 
That brings us to carbohydrates, because when those fish are consuming the, those greens, they're really consuming carbohydrates. And these are hydrocarbons, right? These are um, chains of carbon atoms with uh, little hydrogen atoms stuck to them, and they, they form these nice long chains, uh, you know, sugars and complex carbohydrates. And plants will take those, and they, they build them uh, into their cell walls and their cell structures. Um, some of them are saved for energy. So they'll consume them. They'll uh, take basically take oxygen and they'll consume these um, hydrocarbons or they'll uh, turn them into things like lignin and these other really interesting carbohydrates that are very hard to break down, very hard to decompose. And uh, they're very sturdy structural kind of compounds. It's very, very, very cool. Um, so they're taking water. They're taking CO2. They are taking these things and using light through these photosynthetic and related reactions. And they are um, basically taking these two different things, crushing them and making something entirely new and wonderful out of them, something that we can use. Uh, that's not to say we can't use water, but we certainly can't really use CO2 that much. And we certainly cannot take light energy and turn water and CO2 into something that we can eat. This is something that's very interesting and very unique to plants and uh, algae and some bacteria, right? And we can do it in the lab, but it's not very cost effective. So plants do this amazing reaction all on their own in nature every single day. And when we build a system, all we're really doing is harnessing that reaction. So the goal of this talk today is to think about carbon and oxygen and hydrogen as actual plant nutrients because without them, the plant could not grow, could not survive, could not build cell walls, it couldn't store energy, can't do any of these things without carbon, oxygen, excuse me, and hydrogen. So these are super, super important plant nutrients and they don't get as much press time as a lot of other things because we like to talk about, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. But at the end of the day, those are not nearly as important as carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, without those, the plant can't grow at all. The goal of this talk today is to make you all think about what that actually looks like and why this kind of thing is important. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a bit, and I'm going to talk about CO2 enrichment specifically at a later date, talk about how wonderful it is and how we can manipulate our growing environment with CO2. But until then, just think about these different elements, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen as plant nutrients. So that's it. Um, not super in-depth today, really nice and kind of uh, skimming over the subject here, but we'll revisit this and we'll dig into a little bit more detail down the road. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Aquaponics Academy. We hope that you're finding these uh, podcasts helpful and that they're helping you to understand aquaponics in more detail. So as we jump more into the, to the nitty gritty in future episodes, we just hope that you'll keep tuning in, keep enjoying them, keep getting something from them. On behalf of everyone here at Bright Agrotech, we hope you'll stay tuned for more tips, tricks, techniques in the future episodes. And in the next episode, episode 16, we're going to be discussing potassium, calcium, and magnesium in aquaponic systems. It's going to be a great talk, and we hope you'll tune in for that. <laughs>